this month of October to celebrate Reformation Day and to better understand the, the Reformation. We are doing a sermon series on the five solas. And the five solas are sola scripture, sola gratia, sola fide, sola Christus, and sola deo gloria. And these five solas, they are foundational statements of the evangelical faith, which have their origin in the days of the, the Reformation. So far this month, we have looked at sola scriptura, and last week we looked at sola fide. And today we are looking at solus Christus. But the truth is, really, all of these solas are interrelated. They are connected to each other, and you cannot have one without the others. However, this sola, solus Christus, really does stand at the center of all the other four solas. And theologian Michael Reeves, he says this about the, this sola. He says, the center, the cornerstone, the jewel in the crown of Christianity is not an idea, it's not a system or a thing, it is not even the gospel as such, it is Jesus Christ. And that's what we're going to be looking at today, Christ alone. So please stand with me as we read 2 Corinthians chapter 4, out of respect for God's Word. There really are so many passages that I could have um, taken today to show you from the Scriptures that Christ is our all-sufficient Savior. But um, the Lord led me here to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, and we're going to read the first six verses together. Therefore, having this ministry by the mercy of God, we do not lose heart, but we have renounced disgraceful, underhanded ways. We refuse to practice cunning or tamper with God's word, but by the open statement of the truth, we would commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. Father, please today, again, we ask for your spirit to open our eyes to the truths here for us in your word. Thank you, Lord, for what we just read. You have said, let light shine out of darkness. And you have shone in our hearts to give the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. For everyone who is a believer today, that is true for us. We pray that you continue to shine that light, that we may see your face more clearly. Lord, that our faith would increase and that we would trust in Jesus alone and that we would not be distracted, Lord, and that we would not waver in our faith, in Christ alone. So Lord, we ask, please, teach us and help us to see this very cornerstone, the jewel in the crown of Christianity, who is Jesus Christ, more clearly today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. I hope that you have had edifying conversations at your, your home groups regarding the, the five solas. Last week at our home group, we discussed in length question number three, which was, does Paul mean in Romans chapter 3 verse 28, when, remember when he says that we are justified by faith, does he mean that our faith is the ultimate cause of our justification? I hope you spoke a lot about that. When it comes to salvation, our justification, even our sanctification, the issue is not primarily the amount of our faith, but it is the object of our faith. It is the object of our faith. Remember when Jesus came down from the, the Mount of Transfiguration. A man met Jesus there 
with the news that the disciples had been unable to help his son who was possessed by a demon. And when he begged Jesus to help his son, Jesus replied, If you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. And the man immediately responded, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. Jesus did not tell the man that he must go and that he must muster up more faith. Instead, he, he honored the faith that the man had and he healed his son. And the disciples once asked Jesus, increase our faith. To remember, and Jesus replied, if you have faith as a, as a mustard seed, if you can, you can say to this, this mulberry tree, be, be pulled up by the roots and be planted in the, the sea and it would obey you. Again, it wasn't the amount of the disciples' faith that, that mattered. What mattered was the object of their faith. And the lesson is quite simple. Faith does not save. Everybody has faith. Everybody has faith. I had faith last night that the Irish rugby team would beat the All Blacks. My faith was misplaced. All of us have some type of a faith, don't we? Faith doesn't save us. What saves us is the object of our faith. Faith lays hold of the one who saves. Faith is not independent of reason, but neither is it simply understanding a series of facts. Our faith must be well placed in particular person, and that person is the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is where today's solar, solus Christus, it really intertwines with the solar that we, we studied last week, solar fide. And we will see today how connected they are and how you cannot have one without the others. If people will be saved, they need to know Christ, and they need to know Him alone as the only Savior of sinners. Jesus himself claimed this. He said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. The Apostle Paul, he echoed Jesus' words when he, when he wrote in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5, For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. The Reformers restated the exclusivity of Jesus Christ and the sufficiency of his work in, this, in the Reformation, one commentator, he, he writes, he says, Justification because of Christ alone means that Jesus has done the necessary work of salvation utterly and completely, so that no merit on the part of man, no merit of the saints, no works of ours performed either here or later in purgatory can add to his completed work. In fact, any attempt to add to Christ's work is a perversion of the gospel and indeed is no gospel at all. To proclaim Christ alone is to proclaim him as the Christian's one and only sufficient prophet, priest, and king. We need no other prophets to reveal God's word or will. We need no other priests to, med to mediate God's salvation and blessing. We need no other kings to control the thinking and lives of believers. And he finishes, he says, Jesus is everything to us and for us in the gospel. Which leads to my first point. In verse 5 there, we see a Christ-centered motivation. Look at your Bibles in 2 Corinthians 4 verse 5. Paul says, For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord. For what we proclaim is not ourselves. In other words, we do not preach ourselves. That's what Paul is saying here. And this really is a stinging rebuke that Paul is making to the false teachers here in the context. And Paul is, remember, he's writing this letter to the Corinthian church. He was in the middle of, of major problems at, at this particular time. Um, not only severe physical problems against him, but also some very tragic issues that were going on in in Corinth, regard to his, his character, in regard to his, his reputation, 
how people were, were slandering him, trying to assassinate his character, assaulting his integrity, his, his credibility. And these were the false teachers that were doing it. These false teachers were trying to undermine his credibility. They were trying to undermine the church that he had planted. They were trying to tear the, the flock apart, as it were, to shreds. And reluctantly, Paul finds it necessary to defend his ministry against false teachers who had been criticizing him. And that's really what 2 Corinthians is. It's a, it's a defense of his ministry. From chapter 1 all the way up to, to chapter 4, we see this. And these false religious leaders, outwardly, they were, they were very impressive. They were these charismatic personalities. They made a big splash in the, in the relig religious headlines of the day. And the big issue, however, is that they were false teachers. They were false religious teachers. And whatever their message was, it was there to tickle the ears of the people. It was people-pleasing. Their message was, was popular, but their message was crossless and it was Christless. There was a reason why they were readily accepted and why Paul was rejected. These false teachers preached religion as the way to heaven. These false teachers, they preached Moses rather than Jesus. They preached the law. They preached traditions. They did not preach Christ alone. And Paul refused to, to play fast and, and loose with the gospel of, of Jesus Christ. Look at... Um, Chapter 2 there, or, uh, in chapter 2 in, in Corinthians, Paul appeals to evidence that, that he was faithful in preaching the good news of the new covenant. He, he says in chapter 2, I'm sorry, chapter 2, in verse 15, For we are the aroma of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To one a fragrance from death to death, to the other a fragrance from life to life. Who is sufficient for these things? Look at verse 17. For we are not like so many peddlers of God's word, but as men of sincerity, as commissioned by God, in the sight of God we speak in Christ. Underline there, we are not like so many peddlers of God's word. I think today, unfortunately, we still have many peddlers of God's word. So-called religious leaders who don't preach Christ alone who do play loose and fast with God's Word. And, and as a result, they, they end up exalting themselves rather than, than Christ. Think about ministries who are, who are named after prominent personalities. Their ministries are not named after Christ or any of His characteristics. Their names, the, the ministry is named after a person. I, I don't understand. I, I don't understand that. But still today... In many circles, there are people professing to be preachers of God's Word who are just peddlers, really, of God's Word, who play fast and loose and end up exalting themselves. Do everything you can to stay away from these preachers and churches who do not preach Christ alone. And I'm pretty sure that these false teachers here in 2 Corinthians who had, who had started all of this trouble had accused Paul of this thing, of, of preaching himself, of trying to get all the glory for himself. They, we see they accuse him of, of walking in craftiness. They accuse him of adulterating the Word of God, watering down the Word of God. And in verse 2, he says, he says, that's not true. It's not true. He renounces all of that. And they had also accused him of preaching himself, seeking self-praise, self-promotion, self-glory, having a desire to establish personal power and personal authority and personal gain. And he says there in verse 2, that is not true. It is not true. And here in verse 5, Paul is denying these charges, but at the same time he's accusing his critics who themselves are not preaching Christ alone, who are preaching themselves and peddling God's Word. We'll see today why it's so important that, 
that we do not preach ourselves. Let me just give you three reasons quickly. Firstly, we cannot preach ourselves because we cannot save sinners. I cannot save sinners. You cannot save sinners. Local churches and the gospel has to be built on Christ alone, not on men, not on personalities, not on people. There's a song, on Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. That's what the church needs to be built on. Secondly, because one day all of us will be gone, but Christ will not. All of us will be gone. Our ministries will be gone. Our videotapes will be gone. Our preaching sermon series will be gone, but Christ will not. His word will not. And thirdly, because we will fail. We will let people down. I'm sure you can attest to this. I'm sure people that you've shared the gospel with at some point, you've let down. I've let down. But Christ will not. But Christ will not. And that's why it's so important that we do not preach ourselves, that we, we preach Christ alone. And the only way to ensure this, that Christ is our personal focus, if we are focused on Christ, we will want to draw attention away from ourselves and towards Him. If our attention is on Christ alone, we will want people to see Christ and not ourselves. You know, the truth is one day all of us will have to leave the UAE, we'll have to leave New Life Church. We'll have to go back to our, our own countries or we'll have to go to another country. But please make sure when you, when you leave this church that you do not join a church that plays loose and fast with God's Word. Make sure you find a church that does not peddle God's Word. Be part of a church that exalts Christ through the preaching of the Word. Be part of a church that is willing to decrease so that Christ will, will increase. Which really leads to my second point. Look again at verse 5. All of my points today are, are from verse 5. Notice here in the same verse, the second part of Paul's defense. He did not preach himself. Who did he preach? What does verse 5 say? But Christ Jesus the Lord. Christ Jesus the Lord. That is who Paul preached. You know, the medieval church during the the 16th century, had stopped preaching Christ Jesus as Lord. There's a famous painting of, of Luther in the city church in Wittenberg where, where he is he's standing in the pulpit where he is preaching and he holds one hand up with his index finger extended pointing to, to Christ on, on the cross. And the point that the artist is making is that, is that Martin Luther in his Reformation was doing everything he could to help the church look to Christ, to look to Christ alone. And Martin Luther had much to say to the, to the leaders of the Roman Catholic Church who had, who had stopped preaching Christ the Lord at that point. Luther said that the, the Catholic Church was holding people captive from cradle to grave. What he meant by that is in the church, one was... One was baptized as an, as an infant. One was confirmed as a youth. One was married as a mature person. And then later received sacraments of anointing even on, on your deathbed. This is what, what happened in the, the Roman Catholic Church at that point. And the Roman Catholic Church taught that, that all of these sacraments, all of these traditions along with their ordinations were, were seen as a, as a means of, of grace when it was administered by the, the priests, when it was controlled by the, the priests. And the grace given by these priests was supplemented throughout one's life by, by more sacraments that you had to do, regular confession of, of sin to a, to a priest. And then you had to receive the the, the, the Eucharist through a, through a mass given by, uh, given by a priest. And he would say, from cradle to grave, from cradle to grave, the Christian was dependent upon the Catholic Church and their priests. The Catholic Church and their, their priests. He would say that 
the Christian was chained to these sacraments in, in order to receive grace. And he was right. And that's why so many people protested and so many people looked at the Scriptures and saw what the Scriptures were teaching and saw that they were not looking to Christ alone anymore. Their faith was no longer in Christ alone, but in the sacraments, in the ordinances, in the priest, in the, in the church, in the organization. Luther looked to Scripture. And the effect of his teaching was to shift focus away from the Catholic Church, away from the priests, to Christ alone. Salvation in a single person, Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Paul did the same thing right here in our passage. Paul did not preach himself. He did not preach traditions. He didn't preach sacraments. He did not preach rituals. He did preach Christ Jesus, the Lord. It says in verse 5, not a Lord, the Lord. He preached Jesus as Lord. And our message must be the same. We must understand and we must declare that He is Lord and we are not. That He alone is, is worthy of worship. For He alone can save. We cannot save. We are not worthy of worship. People are not worthy of worship. Rugby teams are not worthy of worship. Christ alone is worthy of worship. The need to declare Jesus Christ as Lord is evident even in the Great Commission, and we spent the whole of last month looking at that. And the key to the Great Commission is not in verse 19 and 20. The key is in verse 18. Remember where Jesus says, All authority has been given to the church. Does he say that? No. All authority has been given to? To me. All authority has been given to me in heaven and in earth. We are to preach the gospel because Jesus is Lord. Our message is centered on His Lordship. And if we don't preach Him as Lord, we end up preaching a false gospel. We end up giving our, our family and our friends, our unsaved loved ones, a false hope if we do not preach Christ as Lord. I remember in India, a pastor once told me the story of, of Stanley Jones. Stanley Jones was a, a Methodist pastor, and he was a good friend of Mahatma Gandhi. And Stanley Jones said of Mahatma Gandhi, these are the words of Stanley Jones, he says, If Mr. Gandhi is not in heaven when I die, then neither will I be. And when the pastor relating this, this story asked what I thought about that, my friend expressed his sadness that Stanley Jones, this Methodist pastor, is not in heaven. <laughs> is not in heaven. And he was correct in saying this. This man had put his faith in Mahatma Gandhi. Mahatma Gandhi has this, this great savior who should go to heaven, who deserves to go to heaven. And if he doesn't go to heaven, then, then who can go to heaven? That's not who our faith is, is through. Our faith is not in Christ and good people. Our faith is in Christ alone. And today people are offended by statements like that. People are offended when we say the only way to heaven is through Christ. People are offended by the exclusivity of Christ. But it is true nonetheless. It is true nonetheless. The Bible teaches that there is no other way to salvation than through Jesus Christ. If Gandhi denied this, then there is no hope of him being in heaven. Jesus himself claimed to be the only way to heaven. In John 14, verse 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to God but through me. He is not a, a way, as in one of many ways. He is the way, as in the one and the only way. No one, regardless of reputation, regardless of achievement, 
regardless of their, their special knowledge or their, their personal holiness, can come to God the Father except through Jesus. Remember in Acts chapter 4, verse 12, the Scriptures tell us, And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. If you try to get to heaven apart from Jesus Christ, you are without hope. If you think we can get to heaven apart from Jesus Christ by keeping five pillars of someone's faith, you are giving other people a false hope. There is salvation in no one else. In our pluralistic world, I think this is a very important issue. This is a very relevant issue. You know, in the midst of our relativ relativism of our day, there is great need for the church to, to resurrect its confidence in the exclusivity of Jesus Christ alone. And what results when we preach Christ alone? When Christ is held up before people, it results in a, in a Christ-centered and a Christ dependent church. The spiritual depth of such a church will result in spiritual breadth. Ephesians 4, we've looked at this many times. Ephesians 4 verse 11 to 16 tells us that the church that grows in its knowledge of Christ will reach out beyond its own borders even as people minister to one another within the body. As people are equipped, as people do the work of the ministry because our confidence is in Christ, not in gimmicks, not in methods, not in people. Our confidence is in Christ alone. When we understand Christ as He is revealed in Scripture, we will leave the, the converting, we will leave the convicting up to Christ. We hold fast to His Word, our confidence is in the person of Jesus Christ, and we allow Him to do the work and show the results. Jesus said in John 10, verse 27, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. When our confidence is in this truth, when we believe and understand this, we will simply point people to Christ and trust that His sheep will indeed hear His voice. And they will follow Him. Even if the message is not something that people want to hear, we know they need to hear it. Even though people don't want to hear that Christ is the only way, we speak it out of love anyway because we know they need to hear it. We point people to Christ and trust that His sheep will hear His voice and follow. Third and last point. Again in verse 5. We see a Christ-centered manner. A Christ-centered manner. Paul preached Jesus Christ as Lord. And look at the last part of verse 5. And ourselves, your servants, for Jesus' sake. And ourselves, your servants, for Jesus' sake. And that word servant there is the word doulos in the original Greek. And the word is translated as, as bondservant in the King James Version. But in the Greek, this word is translated as slave. That is the word slave, not, not really servant. There's, there's, there's a difference between a slave and a servant. Now, under Roman law, a bond servant was considered the owner's personal property. And slaves, essentially, they had no rights. And they could even be killed by their, their owners without punishment. And the Hebrew word for, for bond servant had a, had a similar connotation. However, under the Mosaic law, there was allowance made for a servant to become a slave voluntarily. You could sell yourself to your master for life because he treated you well, because he gave you much, much of what you needed, because he, he took care of you. You could sell yourself to your master voluntarily. In Exodus chapter 21, verse 5 and 6, it says, if the servant declares, I love my master and my wife 
and my children do not want to go free, then his master must take him before the judges. He shall take him to the door or the doorposts, and they will pierce his ear with an owl. Then he will be his servant for life. Pierce his ear with, with a nail. There's your first ear piercing right there. People who were slaves, who voluntarily gave themselves as slaves to their, their masters. And throughout the New Testament, the word bondservant and slave or servant is, is applied metaphorically to, to someone who is absolutely devoted to Jesus. And Paul often referred to himself as a servant of God, a, a slave of God. But here in our verse, notice he uses it a little differently. He says, we are your slaves. We are your slaves for the sake of Jesus to bring you to Christ. To bring you his truth because of our love for him. We're your slaves. We're ready to serve you because our confidence is in Christ alone. He did not see himself in some way as superior to the Corinthian believers, but he saw them as, their, as his fellow workers. And in many ways, this, this is key in keeping the church focused on Christ alone. This, this attitude, this mindset of humility, where Christ must increase, but we must decrease. We read about this, remember, in Philippians chapter 2. Turn there with me quickly. Let me remind you. Let me show you. Just flip over to Philippians chapter 2. Look at verse 5. Philippians 2 verse 5. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. Have this mind among yourselves, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. But what did he do? He emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, the form of a slave. That's the word doulos there. Being born in the likeness of man, and being found in human form, what did Jesus do? He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Humility is vital for us to have this mind set. We are sent by Jesus, just as Jesus was sent by the Father. And that means that we are to live and that we are to minister as, as Christ did with the attitude of a servant. To see ourselves as, as slaves of the King, of the King who loves us, of the King who, who we love, of the King who we are focused on. And maintaining this focus keeps us serving. We remain grateful for His grace. And rather than complaining and grumbling and murmuring and being discontent with the things around us, we keep our focus on Christ alone. And anyone who is in love with Christ and deeply, profoundly devoted to Christ, anyone who has established the Lord Jesus Christ as the object of their affections, the singular object of their love, is going to, to manifest humility, isn't it? They are going to be a servant of the one they love and a servant of those whom the one they love loves. And when we pursue Christ alone, and when we preach Christ alone, we will desire to please Christ alone as we serve others. John MacArthur, in his commentary in this book, he, he says, There's no sense in preaching oneself. There's no sense in exalting human wisdom, ingenuity, technique, or ability. There's no sense in being enamored of my own cleverness, no sense in seeing myself as the source of people's response to the truth. It's ludicrous for me to think that anybody and everybody would respond to this if the preacher were clever enough. I know one thing for sure, and that is that the only one who can turn on the light is God himself. The only one who can turn on the light is God himself. You know, our job is to go to all the switches and, and switch them on. But our job is not to make sure the current is, is flowing through those wires to the light. The only one who could make that light shine is, is Christ himself. And that's what Paul says. Look at verse 6 in our passage. In verse 6, that's how Paul ends this portion of Scripture. He says, For God who said, Let light shine out of darkness, has done what? 
He has shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. This is Paul's conviction here, folks. This is Paul's closing conviction. He is stating his conviction. His conviction in Christ alone. Paul was convinced that salvation is of the Lord. And therefore, according to Scripture alone, he proclaimed salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, all to God's glory alone. Paul didn't want the glory. He wanted Christ to receive the glory because he understood that it is Christ who saves people, not him, not his personality, not his techniques. If he was faithful in preaching Christ alone, people would respond. And I was just profoundly reminded of this again this week, and we spoke a little bit about this this week at our, at our men's book club this week. Some of the struggles and some of the temptations that we're having to, to wander away from the Lord. My, my temptation this morning is, is being stuck here in, in this building. Why, why, can't, why isn't the Lord letting us go back to the zoo? Why, why, is, our, why is our church decreasing and not increase, increasing? Surely if we, we're in the right venue, surely if we have the, the right programs, surely the Lord would add to the church and the, law, and the church would grow. And the Lord said to me this week, preach Christ alone. Stop worrying about the results. Stop worrying about everything else. Put your faith in Christ alone. That's what Paul is saying to all of us. Our confidence needs to be in Christ alone. Not in a venue. We need to be telling people what Christ has done for us. Not waiting to go somewhere to another place in order to tell people about Jesus. Paul says, keep preaching Christ as Lord and keep being his servant, his slave. Keep loving others the way Christ loved you. And may this be our conviction. And may our confidence be in the truth of the solar, Christ alone. May the affections of our hearts also never forget God's love and how wonderful it is to be loved by God to the degree that he has turned the light on in you and he has given you the privilege of loving the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't ever forget that. I found a great story I want to finish with about one of the early church fathers by the name of Polycarp. He was the, the second century pastor of the church of Smyrna and uh, the disciple of, of John the Apostle. At age 86 years old, he was brought to the, the Roman authorities and he was ordered to confess that Caesar is Lord. If he had done this, the Roman authorities told him that he, he would, they would save his life, they would set him free. And they tried to persuade him to apostatize. And they asked him to say, or they said to him, they said to him, have respect for your old age. Swear by the fortune of Caesar. Repent and say, down with the atheists and I will set you free. But Polycarp, he, he refused. He said in response, 86 years have I served Christ alone. And he has done me no wrong. How can I blaspheme my King and my Savior? I'm going to read the rest of the account from Christian History Institute. And the proconsul, the Roman proconsul says, I have wild animals here. I will throw you to them if you do not repent. Call them, Polycarp replied. It is unthinkable for me to repent from what is good to turn to what is evil. I will be glad, though, to be changed from evil to righteousness. If you despise the animals, I will have you burned. You threaten me with fire which burns for an hour and is then extinguished, but you know nothing of the fire of the coming judgment and the eternal punishment reserved for the ungodly. Why are you waiting? Bring on whatever you want. And the crowd collected wood and bundles of sticks from the shops and public uh, baths, and the Jews, as usual, were keen to help and when the pile was ready, Polycarp took off his outer clothes, he undid his belt, and he tried to take off his 
sandal, something he was not used to doing at 86 years old. And the Christians in the audience, the faithful, saw him trying to take off his sandals and they raced forward to help him do it, each wanting to be the ones who would touch his feet. This is how good his, his life was. But when they went to fix him with nails, Polycarp said, Leave me as I am, for he that gives me strength to endure the fire will enable me not to struggle without the help of your nails. So they simply bound him with his hands behind him like a distinguished ram chosen from a great flock for, for sacrifice, ready to be an acceptable burnt offering to God. He looked up to heaven and said, O Lord God Almighty, the Father of your beloved and blessed Son, Jesus Christ, by whom we have received the knowledge of you, the God of angels, powers, and every creature, and of all the righteous who live before you, I give you thanks that you count me worthy to be numbered among your martyrs, sharing the cup of Christ and the resurrection to eternal life, both of soul and body, through the immortality of the Holy Spirit. May I be received this day as an acceptable sacrifice, as you, the true God, have predestined, revealed to me, and now fulfilled. I praise you for all these things. I bless you, and I glorify you, along with the everlasting Jesus Christ, your beloved Son. To you with him, through the Holy Ghost, be glory, both now and forever. Amen. Polycarp was, was burnt and killed at that older age. But as he was burning, the saints were singing and glorifying God for his life, for his faith in Christ alone. And early Christians like Polycarp were, were martyred because they refused to confess Caesar as Lord. They knew that Jesus alone was divine, and that Jesus alone would have no other equal. These Christians knew the New Testament is not merely being polite when it, when it calls Jesus Lord. Rather, the, the, the Scriptures teach that Jesus is God Almighty, the one and the only who can save us. And all these idols of money and these idols of power and prestige and, and sex and so on, can become these, these little gods, isn't it, if we are not careful? Can become these little idols if we're not careful? But let us confess today again that Jesus Christ alone is God. That Jesus Christ alone is Lord and He is able to save. And may we all have a Christ-centered motivation, a Christ-centered message to proclaim, in a Christ-centered manner as we serve and love others for God's glory alone. Let us proclaim the all-sufficient Savior, Jesus Christ, the object of our faith. But to those of you here today whose faith is not in Christ alone, may I urge you to turn from your unbelief. Are you trusting something other than Christ for eternal life? Salvation is found through faith in Christ alone. Will you receive him today? Please pray with me. Father, we do thank you for your word. Your word really is sufficient for all we need. And thank you, Lord, for that timely reminder today that our faith needs to be in Christ alone. He is the object of our faith. He is the author of our faith. He is the supplier of our faith. And He is the finisher of our faith. Thank you, Lord, for sending Jesus, the one who took our wrath, the one who took our punishment, the one who paid the price that we should have. Thank you, Lord, for sending Jesus. And Lord, we pray that we would be faithful in serving our Savior, the one who deserves all the honor, the one who deserves all the glory. May we not be guilty of robbing him of any of that glory, but may we be guilty, Lord, of pointing people to our Savior, the one who indeed 
has risen from the grave and is seated at the right hand of God with all authority. May we be found serving that Savior this week. We ask in Jesus' precious name. Amen.